Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com tells us what the giant bumps on the markets might mean and how precious metals might profit. Seattle corporate lawyer Dan Harris, editor of the ChinaLawBlog.com, gives us some insight into doing business with China and how he believes trade wars will become a permanent state of affairs. Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com, comments on interest rates and how the trucking sector is doing. Plus, at the end of the show, we'll have a company showcase update from American Manganese CEO Larry Ray. We'll talk to Ross Clark right after this. Grand Portage Resources recently completed the 2018 drill program on its 100% controlled Herbert Gold Discovery property located in the prolific Juneau Belt in southeast Alaska. Drill results are expected through late 2018. Past drill results included numerous multi-ounce gold assays on multiple veins. Grand Portage trading symbols are GPG on the TSX Venture, GPTRF on the OTCQB, and GPB on Frankfurt. For more information, please visit our website, Grand Portage.com. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark from ChartsAndMarkets.com, where you'll find insightful market commentary and timely technical analysis. Best of the season, Ross. Best of the season to you as we wind down for the last few days. And some interesting numbers, uh, a very... Bad Christmas Eve, uh, an interesting Boxing Day on the U.S. markets. What's going on out there? Yeah, Ross? and it's a shame in Canada. You know, they uh, we got a number of these holidays in Canada that aren't the same in the U.S. So the uh, the big rally on uh, Wednesday didn't happen in Canada. They had to do a little bit of a catch up on Thursday. But you know, we had um, you know from excesses. That's where you get your your major opportunities and. At the end of last week uh, and into Monday, uh, the broad markets in the U.S., uh, the New York Composite, the S&P, the Dow, were all down 19 to 21 percent off their highs. And, you know, the, the street likes to talk about uh, 20 percent as being a, a bear market. Well, I, I look at it and say, what, you know, what type of declines do you have historically? And markets typically, if you go back over the 100 years or so, uh, they either bottom at around 10% corrections off the high, 20% or 31% plus. And there are, uh, and we put out the report uh, showing that there have been 24 times that we had dropped 20%, uh, 20% um, into a low. And then of those 24 times, 20 times, you got a really good bounce. And so... As of Monday, we got capitulation readings in the S&P 500. Also, had had it for a couple of days in the Russell, and uh, in the S&P. This is this was just the the fourth time since the U.S. election and the, the Friday before the uh, Trump election in 2016. We got some, a capitulation reading, and this is now the fourth one in total in that time period. And those capitulations have, have caught uh, four out of five, what I would say are really good bottoms in the market. So you, the type of opportunity we had on Wednesday morning um, is one that doesn't have come along all that often. And uh, it's uh, it's been quite a second half of the week. We um, you know, have now retraced 38% of the decline from the November high. And that is the classic bounce to be looking for after such an oversold condition. So you're probably looking um, for very little follow through in the next week or so here in the market. Um, at the most, maybe it gives, it corrects back 50% of the decline, but 38% is just a, a classic spot for this first bounce to now find some resistance. So, Ross, where do we go from here with the markets? Uh, are we expecting a very bumpy new year, or will it be a little calmer? Well, I, I think you're going to have uh, still more of this volatility. We need to see how well it comes back down and does on a retest of the support that we put in at uh, the beginning of this uh, last week. Um, the probability is that uh, you know, we're, we're going to thrash around and uh, – as long as the, you know, we need to keep an eye on things like the oil market 
um, the yield curve, uh, see how high yield bonds are doing. And all of these items have become oversold, but they didn't bounce nearly that well. Uh, so you've got oil, which I think as long as it stays below 52, and we're at 45 and a half right now, it's still going to be hunting for a bottom. And I think you'd need to see it push through 52 to think that there's the beginning then of a seasonal push to the upside. Because if you recall, seasonal lows in the oil market tend to happen in January, early February. So there's there's a window here where we can start to look for a bottom. And you can specifically look at, at the oil stocks, which got hit along with everything else, and see how they managed to um, maybe find some support here in the next couple of weeks. Um, the yield curve. You know, we've got uh, the uh, uh, 10 and 30-year uh, bonds uh, yields have come down quite a bit. The 10 years down to 274. That had been at three and a quarter um, back in uh, November. Um, the 10 years at 305 have been up at 345. So, for all that the Fed has been tightening uh, on the short-term uh, rates, the longer-term rates have been coming off here. So. That flattening curve in that part there um, isn't all that good for the banks, uh, so can probably continue to see some pressure over there. The one area that does benefit and has been doing so for the better part of a couple of months now is the precious metals. Um, the, um, the gold market still walking its way up. We're in the 1280s now, and um, I don't see any signs of uh, a top as of yet. We tend to get sequential counts, uh, 13 counts, as you get towards the top end of the seasonal run. We're not even halfway there right now. So um, we've probably got um, a fair amount left in terms of movement in gold. And silver is interesting. Um, back in September, we had a, a sequential setup uh, that uh, is a, a monthly signal. And uh, you don't have a lot of these, maybe six or seven of them in the last 20, 25 years. And then the first month that you have a higher high, which is what we've now done in December, tends to gain some steam here. And uh, as of this week, we're getting the first overbought readings in the silver market that we've had on a weekly chart uh, going back for the better part of a year. And if it can continue to show strength for them and stay overbought for another couple of weeks, then um, you could really seriously not only look at being on the long side, but by the next dip that might come along. Ross, is oil going to continue its seasonal downward plunge? Well, now from a seasonal perspective, I would expect to see some kind of a base happening in here. Um, you know, we had been looking at um, the uh, the stock market and the oil market is falling following what we'd seen in copper two and three months earlier. And based upon that modeling, um, I think, you know, you've got a good chance that crude is is going to stabilize in here and uh, try and form a bit of a base. But uh, it'll be the, the first month with a higher high is what we'll use as the catalyst point to say that a bottom is in place. And if this is part of that 10-year cycle low, which we expected to have, in the fourth quarter of last year or the first quarter of next year, this coming year, um, there can be some pretty good potential coming off the bottom. Ross, have a great new year. And happy new year to you and all the listeners. My guest has been Ross Clark from chartsandmarkets.com. Coming up, Dan Harris next on This Week in Money. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. I'm Greg Johnston, CEO of Carl Data Solutions, an industrial Internet of Things company that provides big data solutions for monitoring critical infrastructure. Carl Data offers machine learning and predictive analytics features through our cloud-based applications to deliver key asset-saving operational insights from massive amounts of data. Carl Data trades on the CSE, symbol CRL, and the pink, symbol CDTAF. For more details on Carl Data, please visit carlsolutions.com. I'm Kelly Jennings, CEO of PowerVan Solutions. PowerVan is a cloud-based provider of auction, inventory, and finance solutions that make buying, selling, and financing vehicles more efficient. 
Parban Solutions trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol PBX and on the OTCQB symbol PWWPF and on Frankfurt symbol 1ZV. For more information, please visit us at PowerBandSolutions.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Dan Harris, a corporate lawyer with Harris Brickin in Seattle. He runs the China Law Blog online at ChinaLawBlog.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money and best of the season, Dan. Thank you. Good to be back. Dan, what are you hearing about the arrest of Huawei's uh, chief financial officer in Vancouver? Well, not much more than what everyone else is hearing about. The only thing I would add to it is that if you read what the Chinese people are saying online about it is they're vociferously complaining about the arrest, but no one seems to be saying she's innocent. And uh, the charges, uh, the U.S. alleges that uh, she ran, I guess, a shadow company that really was hiding Huawei's dealings with Iran. Correct. That's what I've read. Um, and I think that is exactly what she is going to be charged with. I don't know if you've heard this. I just read this today. But a couple of big banks, HSBC, and I believe the other one was Standard Charter Bank, have um, essentially said they're not going to bank Huawei anymore. And at this point, Huawei is probably such a hot potato, it'll be interesting to see what international bank takes them on. And HSBC, they don't mind uh, handling dirty money. They've been found guilty of money laundering for drug dealers. So, <laughs> Yes, and um, I think that... Well, I, I'm not saying yes to the fact that they don't mind handling dirty money, but I'm saying that um, they have already been implicated, I believe, to at least some extent um, <laughs> with respect to Iran, and it may have something to do with Huawei. Is it safe for Canadians and Americans to be in China or to travel into uh, areas that are under the influence of China? I don't know. I'm one of the, I, I'm one of those people who would have told you that it wasn't completely safe even three or four years ago. We get calls a lot more frequently than people would think from people who are being held hostage or in jail in China for reasons that would never happen in Canada or the United States. And I should distinguish between those two things, held hostage and in jail, because what we get a fair amount of are what we call debt hostages, where you've got an American company that's in a dispute with a, let's say their Chinese manufacturer, over $850,000 of bad product, and the American company doesn't want to pay the full $850,000 because they don't believe they got what they sought. And the American gets on an airplane and planning to meet with their Chinese manufacturer to meet face to face to try to work something out. And then their passport is seized. They're put up in a crappy hotel. The local police either completely ignore it or go along with it. And they're held there until the money is paid. And it can be a long, long time. That's debt hostages. And then there's the putting people in jail for things like overstaying your visa, um, having a, employees in China without having a company, things that we would never imagine people would be put in jail for happens all the time in China. So the most recent Canadian per, um, jailing, uh, I read about it just today or else yesterday, is a, a woman, a young woman who is being charged for, I think it is, I didn't read very carefully, teaching um, English without the proper visa. And she's in jail for that. Now, I look at that and I say, would she have been put in jail a year ago? Probably not, because she's Canadian. Why was she put in jail this time? Probably because she's Canadian. 
but we would get we get emails from people who have been put in jail all the time for that sort of thing, but they're usually from Africa or Pakistan uh, or India, where China seems to be willing to act with a lot more impunity. Although I really shouldn't even say impunity because these are violations of Chinese criminal law. Right. And of course, Chinese police officers have extraordinary powers where they can just arrest and hold people without charge for up to two years. Yes. Um, I don't purport to know Chinese criminal law terribly well. And so I don't know which police forces have that sort of authority. And also, I don't believe that you can hold somebody for up to two years on every kind of charge or potential charge. I think it has to be something of more national significance. I don't think you could do that just because somebody's suspected of shoplifting. Well, who knows? Like I said, they they seem to make it up on the spot. Well, (laughs) what's interesting about China is they don't make it up on the spot that much. Uh, When I first started dealing with communist countries, it was Russia. And before um, I started dealing with Russia, I was under the impression that places like Russia and China had no laws. Then I realized that's completely wrong. They have laws for everything. And that way, no matter what you do, you're, you're always in violation of one law or another. So if they choose to put you in jail, it's pretty easy for them to do so following the law. Well, I was going to say uh, we have two Canadians uh, accused of violating or being a threat to China's national security. Well, everybody has a cell phone that has a camera now, so you're carrying a secret camera. So why do you have a secret camera? Are you collecting secrets? Well, the good, I mean, (laughs) yes, that's all true. But a year ago, the risk of a Canadian being arrested in China, especially a Canadian not of Chinese descent, for infringing on China's national security interests, was pretty low unless they were working for an NGO or perhaps even a newspaper uh, or a publication that China really didn't like. But the average business person um, who is going to China to have their widgets made, that's pretty low risk. Canadians also had a cachet from Dr. Norman Bethune, who assisted the Chinese Revolution under Chairman Mao and was considered a a Chinese hero. I guess uh, he doesn't carry that much weight anymore. (laughs) No, I don't (laughs) think so. China's a very practical country, and uh, in dealing with Chinese companies, we always tell our clients, they're always asking, what have you done for me lately? This idea of long-term relationships, it's not really true. It wants... um, in the business world, once they decide that they can do better doing business with someone other than you, they will. Uh, is it and, a different attitude if you're dealing with Japanese companies, or have they changed their uh, long-term? No, Japanese companies, once you're in, you're pretty much in. And, and they really treasure personal relationships. Yes, and I'm not saying that past the, the Chinese companies don't also, but I am saying that once... Um, the value of the personal relationship declines. Um, it's good to have a really strong contract. We'll have more with Dan Harris when This Week in Money returns. Cypress Development Corp.'s flagship lithium project is located just east of Alva Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. 
to view our comprehensive company presentation, and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Dan Harris in Seattle. Dan, what are you hearing about China's economy and their real estate market? Well, let me talk about the economy first, which I have a better sense of than the real estate market. Um, for months, I've been telling every reporter who's called me and everybody who asked me that China's economy is due for a big fall. And the reason I've been saying that is because once Trump started talking about tariffs, Virtually all, almost all of our clients started doing two things. One, they loaded up on goods for Christmas, which happens every year. But two, they started making double the amount of their usual purchases to beat the tariffs, which they believed would be coming January 1. And everybody I know who's in a position to know about this, was telling me the same thing. Uh, a friend of mine in the logistics business was saying they've never been busier because of this double purchasing. Um, people have bought their products from China well into next year. So that's been going on. And at the same time, um, our international trade lawyers, which uh, to me has always been one of the less sexy practices of law have always become, have now all of a sudden become incredibly sexy because all these companies want to know how they can have their products that have been made in China for the last 10 years now made in Vietnam or in Thailand and made so that they will qualify as being made in Vietnam and Thailand even though a certain percentage of the parts comes from China. And so companies in industries um, that probably should have left China years ago, they're jumping fast. I'm talking like furniture and clothing, um, sort of low-level kitchen appliances, um, doors, things, things like that. So many of our clients that were all the way in China are now all the way out China or that were half in China and had facilities in Taiwan as, or Thailand as well. They're setting things up so that they're going to be completely in Thailand. And I accidentally said Taiwan instead of Thailand, which is probably a good thing because electronics manufacturers, some of them are moving to Taiwan as well. So you, I, what I see happening come January or February or March, I don't know when it's going to be, but China is going to get hit with a double whammy. There's going to be a massive decrease in factory orders because the front loading will be over, and they're going to get hit because so many companies have, will have moved out of China by then, and there are going to be more that are going to keep moving out. And when I tell people this, especially people who do not want to hear it, uh, they say, oh, no, that's not going to happen. Um, they would have moved by now. Um, it's too difficult to leave China. Well, a oh, and they also say no one's going to leave just based on um, the threat of a tariff. And my response to that is you don't understand the pent-up anger. So many of our clients have said, I don't care if the tariffs never come into effect. I should have moved out a long time ago. China's gotten so difficult. I dislike doing business there so much. This has been the impetus for me to finally get moving on this. And so it's not just the tariffs that it's, 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 it's like the tariffs are what broke the camel's back for a lot of these companies. Right, so China's not an easy place or a pleasant place to do business if you're a foreigner? No. <laughs> it, it, it never has been. Um, 
I might be exaggerating here, but actually I don't think I am, but all of our clients who have moved from China to Vietnam or Thailand um, or the Philippines or Indonesia or Taiwan have said that they much prefer it. Now, interestingly enough, some of those that have moved out of China over the years actually moved back to China even though they didn't want to, but they felt they needed to because people just assume that, let's say, Vietnam is going to be cheaper. But let's say we had a very high-end clothing maker, a well-known designer, and they moved uh, as a client, and they moved from China to Vietnam, and they had so much trouble um, getting some of the materials and buttons and things like that that they needed it ended up costing them more to be in Vietnam than in China. So they moved back to China even though they did not want to because they preferred living in Vietnam. They preferred the Vietnamese employees. Um, but the money, strangely enough, dictated that they move back. So it, it's these are not simple equations. And are the countries that they, they are moving to out of China welcoming because they're glad to see the business and the new investment opportunities it presents for them? 100% true. The problem is they can't, they're not necessarily always going to be capable of handling the business. So we had one company that makes massive, massive quantities of a particular product and um, they would talk to Thai factories and Vietnamese factories and say, can you make this product for us? And they would say yes. And then they would say, can you make it in this quantity? And they would say, no, not even close. So it, it is, China is an amazing country for manufacturing. There's nobody that can compare. Nobody. And so for our clients that have a factory in China and then set up a, their own factory in Thailand, that in some ways is easier than a company that has 8 billion widgets made in China and is trying to now get 8 billion widgets made in Thailand or in Vietnam. There's not nearly the level of contract manufacturing um, in these other countries that there is in China. So uh, going back to Chinese real estate, have you heard anything about the state of that? Well, yes. What I'm hearing is that it's hurting. The thing about Chinese real estate, though, is it's always so difficult to know what's going on because it, it's sometimes propped up. There, there are all these government rules on, you know, how many houses you can own, and then they relax them. Uh, there are a lot of people in China who uh, don't necessarily want to buy real estate in China as an investment, but they have so much trouble getting their money out of China that they do so. Um, so it's 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 kind of like real estate anywhere else in that what's going on in Beijing is not necessarily the same thing that's going on in the hinterlands, etc. But there is a lot of fear in China right now about the economy. I, I just read today an economist from, from Renmin University was talking in China, and he basically said he thinks the GDP's gone negative. Now, that's certainly not the official Chinese line, but none of this is, can be good for real estate. But there is a, still a lot of money that is in China that is not allowed to leave, and that's going to prop up real estate. We'll have more with Dan Harris when This Week in Money returns. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, and the Yukon. Trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the pink symbol ABN AF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. 
MGX Minerals is revolutionizing the new energy economy with patented lithium extraction technology, replacing traditional solar evaporation using low-cost, low-energy nanofiltration. The first system of this paradigm shift technology is currently being commissioned. MGX Minerals trades on the CSE, symbol XMG, the OTCQB, symbol MGXMF, and Frankfurt, symbol 1MG. For more information, visit our website, mgxminerals.com. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back. You're listening to This Week in Money. My guest is Dan Harris. Dan, are President Trump's tariffs and trade war leading to tough times in China, even though many of those tariffs haven't even gone into effect? Yes, they are. And um, I am not a fan of President Trump at all. And But... I think the media is not seeing the tariff picture completely accurately, meaning they keep acting like it's not going to have any chance um, to have an impact, but it is already having an impact. It's having a big impact on China. It's having a big impact on companies that do business with China. Yes, it's true. Not many companies are saying that they're going to move from China back to the United States. So if that's the goal of the tariffs, it's really not working. But a lot of companies are saying, I'm going to move from China to Thailand. And I think that um, geopolitically, that's better for the United States than having all these American companies tied to China. So if that's President President Trump's goal, it is working. Or if his goal is to essentially try to keep China down, which China has accused the United States of doing, that is actually working as well. And I think it's also important to mention that it's not just the United States that has these beefs with the way China does its trading. Just today, there was a headline, which I haven't read the article on, saying that the EU is pressuring the WTO to do something about China's forced technology transfers. If President Trump were not so incapable of um, navigating our allies, countries like Canada, the EU, Japan, etc., um, it would seem to me that we could pr- pretty easily gather up a group of countries to pressure China on its forced technology transfers and its clo- economy, which is so closed to foreign companies. As China's real estate market collapses, what are home buyers and speculators in China likely to do? Well, I mean, in, in legal terminology, that's a, a leading question because you say as it collapses, and I don't know that it's going to collapse. Um, but what what they'll do is exactly what people anywhere else in the world do, which is they either hang on to their properties or they sell them. Um, it will get tougher to borrow against properties, which was somewhat common in China. Well, it is somewhat common in China. But what's also happened is that it's gotten tougher now than even a year ago when it was tougher than the year before that for Chinese citizens to get money out of China to buy property in places like Vancouver and Seattle. I don't know what the real estate market is like in Vancouver these days. I know you guys instituted that, um, I believe it was 15% tax. Um, But here in Seattle, Chinese buying has almost evaporated. It evaporated long before they put in. They now boosted the tax to 20%, but you're taxing ghosts. There weren't weren't people buying. Okay. If uh, now if Chinese uh, the Chinese economy uh, declines, are people there more likely to sell their property in North America to cover their losses in China, or are they going to sell property there and hold on to what they have uh, overseas? That's a very good question, and my answer, uh, and of course I could be wrong about this, is that it's going to obviously depend. If you've got a Chinese family that has one property 
in Seattle or one property in Vancouver, they're going to be very reluctant to sell that because they view that property, there's a good chance they view that property as their future, their way out of China, their permanent way out. Uh, so those properties are probably not going to be sold so quickly. But I think that if you've got somebody who owns five properties in the U.S. and Canada, then you're going to see them sell those properties before they sell their ones in China simply because the market is going to be better here than in China. And we've already seen that writ large with respect to the China, the Chinese conglomerates that have been forced by essentially by the Chinese government because they were so over leveraged they sold their properties um, in the U.S., in Canada, in Europe, big commercial properties. How tough is it now for Chinese nationals to move their money out to buy high-end real estate? Legally, it's basically impossible. Um, and that's the, the law hasn't changed, but they've really, really cracked down. And in order to send out more than $50,000, or I believe now to send out any amount, you have to say that it's not to buy property. Um, so it, it's very tough. And um, China's really trying to cut off every avenue. Now, there are, to get this money out that's needed to buy properties, there are ways... Um, that people try, they've tried Bitcoin, they've, you know, they send it to Hong Kong, whatever. Um, so there, there'll always be some money that gets out. I don't know the figures, but I'm pretty certain that the amount that's getting out to buy property, even if, um, well, it's got to be a lot lower because you and I both were saying that the buyers in Seattle and Vancouver have, the Chinese buyers have dried up. And and that's why. Is most of the money that's uh, coming to uh, Canada and uh, in the rest of the world being used to launder uh, ill-gotten gains? Not necessarily, no. Um, I don't have any idea of what the percentages are. Um, but corruption, I believe, in China has actually declined. Because President Xi is serious about cracking down on corruption in China. Now, when I say that, a lot of people say, well, he's serious about cracking down on corruption per done by those who are not his base. Um, that could be true. All I know is that I hear stories from our clients that's things like, you know, I used to um, get hit up every time or a lot of the times when I try to bring my products, ship my products in, and that never happens anymore. Um, so th we're hearing from our own clients about a decline in corruption. Um, so it that that is happening. But a lot of the money that used to come here was Chinese companies that – sell their widgets to the U.S. and then have the U.S. company pay for those widgets into a Hong Kong bank account. Now, that is still very common, but it seems to be a little bit less common than it used to be. Um, because technically, in order to have a bank account outside of China, if you're a Chinese citizen, you're supposed to have government approval. And none of these companies have it, or virtually none. Now, to help deflate the real estate bubble in Vancouver, the provincial government brought in that foreign buyer's tax. Is that kind of tax happening in other jurisdictions around the world, or are they just outright banning foreigners from buying local real estate? Well, I'm not a worldwide real estate expert, so I can't really give a sort of <laughs> – I can't give a worldwide answer. I can say that New Zealand, I know, has – really crack down on foreigners buying real estate. Um, and I know because we deal, our law firm deals a lot with Spain and Portugal, I know that those countries are talking about it. 
The B.C. government is investigating money laundering in casinos and real estate. Are other jurisdictions around the world doing the same? I just assume that they are. I don't know why they wouldn't be, because, I mean, that's where a lot of Chinese money gets laundered. No doubt about it. It's always surprised me here in the United States how um, lax the U.S. government has been in terms of allowing Chinese citizens to um, take their money out of China to get visas here, because essentially the U.S. is condoning um, what what almost has to be illegal, which is diverting money from China uh, in violation of Chinese laws. I think the U.S. His policies are we don't like those laws, so we're not going to uh, we're going to turn the blind eye to them. Does China frown on its people laundering money, or does it just turn a blind eye? I think they do frown on it um, because they do generally frown on corruption, and they do frown on money leaving the country illegally. How big a problem is intellectual property theft by entities in China? It's a big problem. <laughs> uh, it's less of a problem now than five years ago. Um, although I say I say that, and I just realize that's not necessarily true because uh, I've been doing I've been dealing with China intellectual property issues for a long, long time. That's really sort of what I mostly focus on. And I, my knee jerk answer is always that it's not great, but it's, it's always getting better. Um, I think that that's still true in terms of the legal enforcement in China. But what we've seen since Trump started talking about the tariffs, we've seen more companies try to grab IP fast from our American, Canadian, and European clients than even six months ago. And I think the reason for that is simply that these Chinese companies are thinking, I don't know what it's going to be like five months from now. I'm not going to wait. I'm just going to grab it now. In the past, um, the Chinese companies thinking was more along the lines of, hey, I might be able to have a really good and profitable long-term relationship with this company, so I'm not going to steal their IP. And then when things started deteriorating, that's when they stole the IP. Now, I think they're more skeptical of the possibility of a long-term relationship, probably because they see companies leaving. Do you see an end to the U.S.-China trade war in any time soon? No, <laughs> I don't. I think it, the only reason I hesitate is because Trump is such a wild card. He is so unbelievably unpredictable. He doesn't even know what he's going to think tomorrow. How should I know? But if what he has said over the last six months is to be believed, then no, there will be no end to the trade war. Because President Trump has said <coughs> that China needs to stop stealing IP and open up its economy <coughs> to foreign businesses. Well, neither of those things are going to happen. And neither of those things are going to happen quickly. And opening up China's economy is not going to happen because what a lot of what Trump is saying needs to be opened up because the the most closed sector, big sector, is China's Internet. And China's not going to open up its Internet to a bunch of foreigners. It's not going to happen because President Xi wants total or almost total control over the Internet. He has cracked down on content um very hard since coming into power and and his crackdown seems to increase every year and he does that for political reasons so it it would be a real about face for him to now all of a sudden say oh yeah come on in new york times set up a website well we know that's not going to happen now of course i'm picking something extreme but they're also not going to say oh come on in google make your search um, uncensored, come on in Amazon and freely and fairly compete with Alibaba. 
That's just not going to happen. And so if Trump is serious, then the trade war is going to continue. I went to a conference at Berkeley uh, maybe four months ago, and there were about 75 of us there, 25 lawyers, 25 academics, 25 high-level executives, roughly, um, all of whom deal with China. And we had this massive roundtable and talked all day. Um, it was We were invited. It was sponsored by a big U.S. corporation. Very nice event. And what completely shocked me was that pretty much everybody there agreed with me. And what they agreed with me on was that this trade war was going to continue and that President Trump was justified in being tough with China. Now, no, nobody said, I think tariffs are the way to go. A lot of people were saying, I don't know how we should do it, but it is good that we are doing something. And I was surprised because I thought most people would disagree with my position. It turned out everybody agreed with everybody else. And by the time we left there that day, we were calling the trade war the new normal. And that's the terminology I like to use because I think this is the new normal in terms of relations between the U.S. and China. And I think that it's eventually going to be the new normal for countries like Canada and regions like the EU as well. And I hope I'm wrong. I really do. Um, but if you talk to people who deal with China day in and day out, that is the consensus. And what what people are also talking about and reading is that the people who deal with China, the people who profit from China, are not nearly as pro-China as they were five, six, seven years ago. We were the our company makes a lot of my law firm makes a lot of money um, helping companies deal with China. It's not my and it's I'm not um, benefiting by talking down relations. I'm just trying to be honest and realistic. But the thing is, the attitude people like me have towards China has really changed. We believed in uh, a China that was opening up, a China that was getting freer, a China that was getting more um, economically sound, and we've been fooled too many times to have any stars in our eyes anymore. Do the Chinese uh, government and people have a different approach and way of doing business compared to North Americans? I'm sure that they do, um, but I'm not an expert really on how governments operate with each other. What I can tell you is that um, the Chinese government has plenty of very smart, very good long-term thinkers. And... Um, but at the same time, what I can also tell you, and I, I think this is true, when I talk to some of my Chinese friends who are high-level professors in China, um, they are saying that China was very much caught off guard by President Trump. I'm kind of laughing here because um, I'm not sure it's possible not to be caught off guard by President Trump. But I don't think that they ex they did not expect him to be so serious and so tough about this, and they did not expect the 75 people who were in that room with me in Berkeley to actually not necessarily support President Trump, but not oppose w w a lot of what he's doing with China. You're not getting the people who know China well stepping up and saying what President Trump is saying about China isn't true. You're just not getting that. Now, he does exaggerate, and I've said that many times, but overall, most of what he's saying is true. And that's why Europe is joining in. That's why Japan is, um, I think Japan is now saying, um, remove all the Huawei equipment and stop buying from them, things like that. Dan, before you go, uh, can you tell our listeners about China Law Blog? Sure. Um, it's a blog that we've been writing for about 15 years. We 
post something pretty much every day. A lot of it is um, focused on businesses that are doing business with China, and um, a little of it is focused on big picture issues like trade between the U.S. and China, um, what it's like for foreigners in China, um, and as our clients are moving out from China, we're expanding even beyond China as well and writing more about what it's like to move from China to Thailand, to move from China to Vietnam, etc. Dan, thank you so much for chatting with us, and congratulations, Seattle, getting an NHL franchise. <laughs> and only Canadians know it. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, well, I'll at least 30,000 uh, Seattle residents know because they've put in deposits for season tickets. And, and I just assume they're all Canadians. <laughs> you, you could be absolutely right. <laughs> all right. Talk to you later. My guest has been Dan Harris, a corporate lawyer with Harris Bricken in Seattle. He runs the China Law, Law Blog online at chinalawblog.com. He was speaking to us from the Emerald City, Seattle. Coming up, Wolf Street's Wolf Richter, next on This Week in Money. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. Work programs are underway in Finland and Canada. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol ADD, on Frankfurt symbol 82A1, and the OTCQB symbol ASDZF. Please visit our website arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. My guest is Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com. He's speaking to us from San Francisco. Happy New Year, Wolf. Well, Happy New Year, Tim. Thanks for having me back. Wolf, the Fed has been raising interest rates for three years. Bond yields have have been rising in response. How has this impacted the U.S. banks? Yeah, so let's uh, back up a little bit. Uh, the Fed raised in December earlier, the Fed raised uh, its interest rate, its target range for the federal funds rate for the ninth time in this rate hike cycle. So it, uh, the range is now uh, from 2.25% to 2.5%. Uh, fourth rate hike in 2018. A year ago in 2017, uh, the Fed indicated that it would raise rates only three times in 2018. So now we had our fourth rate hike. So this is much more than projected a year ago. Now, this is the slowest rate hike cycle in history. It started from near zero, and three years later, we're at 2.5% or just below. Uh, yeah, so the rates remain historically low. But... From the clamoring on Wall Street and the White House, you'd think that rates have been propelled into the stratosphere. So we've got to keep that in mind. His rates are still historically low. They've come, gone up very, very gradually. It took them three years to make in small, tiny baby steps to get this far. And uh, at this point, the federal funds rate is just barely above the rate of inflation as measured by CPI. And... Uh, you know, it's really not a whole lot that has happened yet. And so short-term rates have gone up with uh, uh, with the rate hikes. Long-term rates don't respond that directly. And uh, so at, at one point, the 10-year U.S. yield rose to 3 and a quarter percent uh, early in 2018. It's now dropped quite a bit from there. Um in terms of corporate bonds, they have been, the, the yields have been rising uh, on the chunk bond side. 
uh, we uh, we set the seed. Now, finally, after three years of not of crushing off the Fed entirely, the riskiest end of the chip bond market is finally reacting uh, to the rate hikes and, and is coming up. So, response when uh, when yields rise, the prices go down. That's uh, just automatically that way. So, if uh, if the yields go from four percent to five percent. The price of that bond is going to decline to generate that yield. And U.S. banks are huge holders of bonds. In total, they have about $18 trillion in assets. And most of that is loans to, you know, to customers. Uh, but about almost $4 trillion of this, trillion with a T, uh, is securities. And these securities include uh, treasury Securities uh, and corporate securities usually of uh, corporate securities usually of, of, of investment grade, and uh, these uh, rising yields have caused these prices to decline. And so, in the third quarter, the FDIC, which insures uh, these banks, and there's over 5,000 banks in the United States are in this group. So the FDIC, which insures these banks, reports quarterly uh, on these banks. And uh, so for the third quarter, it reported that banks had unrealized losses on these securities of $84 billion. Now, unrealized loss is is a loss uh, on a security that you haven't sold yet. So you have it in your portfolio and you take a paper loss on it. Uh, the unrealized loss becomes real only when you sell it. Now, these are securities that banks can hold to maturity. And when they hold it to maturity, uh, you know, banks get paid, or all the holders get paid face value. So the loss disappears. The, the closer the maturity date approaches, you know, the, the, the further the loss disappears until when they get, get paid face value and there's no loss at all. But these are long-term uh, security. So the Fed, I mean, the, the banks will hold them for for about six years on average, and uh, and a lot of things can happen in those six years. If nothing happens, if it's smooth sailing and nothing happens, uh, these eighty four billion dollars in losses recognized in the or uh, booked in in, uh, in the third quarter um, will go away. Now. These are losses, paper losses that have not made it to the bank's income statement. So they, they haven't shown up in the income statement yet. They're just disclosed as, as unrealized losses on the statement. Now in, uh, the first three quarters of this year, banks have disclosed $200 billion of unrealized losses on these bonds. So that's starting to be a fairly large amount. And uh, in a rising interest rate environment, that was to expect it. I, I ducked through uh, uh, Wells Fargo Bank's uh, third quarter uh, filings, and uh, and all banks have to disclose this. You know, and Wells Fargo had $8.8 .8 billion in unrealized losses on these securities uh, in, in, uh, disclosed, you know. And, and so $8.8 .8 .8 billion is, is quite a bit of money for Wells Fargo. That's just, uh, so that's how far this year. Uh, that's just one bank out of, out of 5,000. Uh, so at this point, no one is worried about it because, you know, you, you're gonna, they're gonna hold them to maturity, even though they may have wanted to trade them, but now they can no longer afford to trade them because then they would actually have to book the loss and have to take it against income. Uh, so they, they are now forced to hold these securities uh, until they mature. Now, what happened during the financial crisis is that there was a liquidity crunch, and uh, c customers were pulling the deposits out of this bank, out of these banks, and uh, banks had to come up with the money to uh, uh, to give give their customers. And so there's a, a general liquidity crunch during the financial crisis, and banks had to sell their assets, had to sell some of their liquid assets um, to come up with the liquidity uh, to, to do business as normal. And when they did this, they locked in uh, these paper losses. These paper losses became real as uh, banks had to sell those assets at, at what will fire sell prices. And this can happen again. So if, if banks are forced now, for some reason, in a liquidity crisis, 
to sell some of these assets, and they hold these assets to be there for a crisis. These are, you know, the U.S. Treasury bonds are very liquid, they're good market for it, and uh, even during a crisis, you can sell them. Uh, so this is kind of a liquidity measure that they have. But uh, when they have to sell them, when they when they're looking at these paper losses, they're going to lock in those paper losses, and they become real losses, and they hit capital and hit income and so forth. This is a problem uh, that uh, you know we're we're going to have to be aware of with banks. Now, banks are very well capitalized this time around. I mean, now once the Fed has done it, it has forced the, the banks to accumulate large capital cushions, so banks can take much larger losses than they could last time. So, uh, uh, you know, that's on the on the other side of the ledger. There's now a lot of capital. And uh, banks are able to take, uh, uh, you know, much larger losses than they were able to take in 2007 and 2008. So we'll have to see how that works out. But this is this is a, not just the banks, you know. Now this is happening in uh, pension funds. This is happening in bond portfolios and bond mutual funds. This is happening around the investment community all over the place. That these rising uh, yields cause massive paper losses. Uh, and when funds or anyone else is forced to sell the securities at that time, it turns those paper losses into real losses. And so bonds have become a losing proposition so far this year. And uh, along with many other things, you know, most everything is uh, uh, is falling. And we've got stocks down, bonds down, uh, real estate is turning. Uh, you know, a lot of other things are heading south together. Uh, but in terms of bonds, yeah, the banks are showing really uh, how painful this can be. And even though, yeah, the economy is doing well and there's no crisis and uh, there are no major problems and, and you know, growth is good at this point. And already we're seeing, uh, because of rising interest rates, we're seeing uh, the damage done to investors that are holding these bonds. Now, with rising interest rates, could that encourage people to actually save money once again if they get something from their savings account? Yeah, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's the positive side of the ledger, and it is a very big positive because in the United States, uh, savers have about $9 trillion in banks as deposits, and, uh, and those deposits aren't zero, essentially, for eight years. And many of these savers or retirees that were counting on the cash flow from these CDs. And when the, re- when the CDs matured, they had to replace them with a CD that, uh, that had a CD that, that produced 5% uh, interest income a year, and then they had to replace it when it matured with one that produced uh, 0.5%. And their cash flow collapsed. And that, in part, is responsible why uh, uh, people dependent on cash flows over the last eight years, have cut back their purchases because you know their the income just collapsed. Retirees' income just just collapsed, and uh, and there are many many stories on that. I mean, it's just it's just it's just a pandemic thing. It was a wealth transfer from savers to banks. So now that is reversing, and uh, in on a basic uh, high yield savings account today, you get two percent in the United States. Uh, one year, year, one year CDs are getting close to three percent in the treasury market. Short term treasury securities, you know, they're close to three percent. So uh, this is really, and 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 cash now. So meaning short term investments like treasuries or or CDs or savings accounts. Cash is one of the few winning uh, sectors in 2018. Yeah, you know, cash is up depending on what you got between one and a half and three percent. And, uh, or everything else is just about, has just about fallen. So, uh, yes, this has been a big change. And, uh, U.S. Treasury securities, especially, uh, or across the board really are, are now very much sought after, uh, for, for the current yield. Now, it's not, uh, people who bought them, who bought a, you know, 10 year treasury three years ago, uh, they, they're they're looking at a loss, but people who buy a one year or two year treasury security today uh, that they're intending to hold to maturity, they're looking at a at a guaranteed interest income of close to three percent. And uh, uh, so this is a big change, is a big positive, and a lot of people are really excited about that. And President Trump should take credit for it 
You know, I mean, he, he, he mentioned it during it, the, during the campaign, the prudent people that have done everything right for eight years were completely crushed in this asset bubble that the Fed has created and in the interest rate policy that it has imposed on them. And they're now getting a little bit of income from the savings, you know, and they're ecstatic. They love it. And uh, they're really happy. And, uh, and that's a, that's a good part of the population out there that, that likes that. And, and I think President Trump should, should, you know, rather than while I'm basting the Fed for raising rates, he should take, uh, he should take credit for that and say, look, savers, uh, I, I'm making you lots of money. I'm making you happy, you know, and, and think of all the votes he could get that way. <laughs> we'll have more with Wolf Richter when This Week in Money returns. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking with Wolf Richter, publisher of wolfstreet.com. Wolf, the trucking industry, from manufacturers to the truckers themselves, is often seen as a barometer of the goods-based economy. So, so far, how is the trucking business doing? The trucking business had a phenomenal boom. And uh, that started in uh, mid-2017, late 2017, and uh, went through the summer of 2018. And this follows a transportation recession that lasted a year and a half that was really brutal that led to layoffs in the, among the truck manufacturers and engine makers and uh, all kinds of problems with uh, trucking companies and, you know, freight rates plunged and, and uh, the 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 the, the desperate uh, shortage of drivers suddenly disappeared, and uh, but that transportation recession ended in in early 2017, and then suddenly it boomed, and it could be the the tax cuts, and it could be the, such as the, the tax credits, and it could be uh, front loading ahead of uh, the tariffs, perhaps or. Uh, you know, it could just be the, the, the phenomenon of the Trump bump, but it went on a, a historic boom in terms of uh, shipment, uh, in terms of freight rates. Everything just soared. And so trucking companies uh, ordered uh, record numbers of, of trucks from truck manufacturers of the pa- over the past 12 months. They ordered nearly 500,000 trucks, and these are Class A trucks. These are the big rigs that you see driving down the highway. They ordered 500,000 of them. I mean, it's unheard of numbers. Uh, in the summer month, uh, uh, July and August, they ordered uh, over 50,000 each those months. And I mean, these, these are record numbers that beat prior records by a very large percentage. But uh, and and everybody was just just really high on this and and uh, I mean this is going to be the boom that lasts forever. But this is a very cyclical business. So already in September and October, uh, the orders to truck manufacturers started dropping. Uh, in uh, November, uh, they actually fell below where they were a year ago. So this is the first year. Uh, since the transportation recession, the truck orders came in below a year ago. Uh, and in November, they ordered 25, 27,000, uh, units. Uh, that was down almost 50% from the peak in August. So this has been an extraordinary, uh, uh, slowdown that happened very suddenly after a, uh, after a historic boom. And yeah, this industry is so cyclical because there's starting to be demand and trucking companies are short equipment and so they order and then it, the manufacturers get a little bit tightened filling those orders and so then trucking companies think, oh my God, oh my God, I'm not going to be able to get my trucks so I'm going to order a whole bunch of trucks right now so maybe I can get ahead of the line. And so you have this explosion of orders where everybody's trying to outrun everybody else. And, uh, and then suddenly, uh, 
you know, the industry realizes that shipments, yeah, they were really strong, but now they're not strong anymore. And, you know, and then, then they're starting to cancel orders and, and so forth. And that's what's happening right now. Uh, there's, truck orders are still good. So they're still above the level of the recession, uh, the transportation recession in 2016 and 2017. They're about half of the peak, you know, but they're, they're still above, uh, uh, the, the catastrophic level. Uh, and so they're, they're not that bad, but they have to just, just plunged, you know. I mean, this is just a very sudden decline. In terms of overall freight shipments in the United States, uh, that boom also, uh, petered out. And, uh, it, it was tremendous in, in the earlier part of, of 2018. And in part because, uh, I assume the front loading of the tariffs, um, it also had to do with, uh, companies increasing the inventories all around. So the, you know, the, the supply chain started to experience bottlenecks. And because you can't get your stuff quick enough, you start ordering more. It goes through the same cycle. And that started slowing down too. And suddenly in, in November, uh, the overall shipments are by truck, by rail, by air, and by barge. So the overall, sh- and, and it excludes commodities. So these are products for, for consumers and for industrial companies, but not commodities. So an overall shipment, uh, they, they dropped, uh, to about the same level that they were a year ago and at about the same level in, in November that they were in November 2014. So they have come off a, by a big margin, uh, from the peak earlier this year. This is showing up in other data, uh, in truckload data and in, in all kinds of data are now pointing at, at, at the end of this boom. And it's, it's not a, uh, and it, the orders are, the truck orders are below the, where they were a year ago. So this is starting to be a, a somewhat a recessionary data point because they're below where they were a year ago. Uh, in terms of the, but you know, this is volatile stuff that so we have to wait and see what, what December and the next few months bring. Uh, in terms of overall shipments, they're still strong, but they're just far lower than they have been. And this is seasonal, so we're comparing November to November. And, uh, uh, so, you know, the, or we we'll compare July to, to July and May to May, you know, so we see the year over year differences. And now the year over year differences have just vanished. So we're back where we were in 2017 and back where we were in 2014. And, uh, so the, the, as in so many other aspects of the economy, you know, this could be called the Trump bump and, and it's vanishing. It's, it's essentially gone. We're now sort of going back to some normalish levels. And, uh, uh, which will be a good thing for, for, uh, shippers, you know, for, and, and for, for people depending on their supply, or for companies depending on their supply chain, you know, because all that got clogged up and now it's freeing up and, and, uh, uh, it, it, you yeah, know, making it a little bit easier to do business. Uh, on, on the other hand, freight rates, uh, are still increasing from a year ago. They're, the increases are shriveling, but the, they're still there. Uh, so at this point, we have not seen any pressure, any downward pressure on freight rates. Uh, that will be if if shipments continue the, that current trend. Uh, yeah, the, we will we will probably see freight rates uh, uh, decline, uh, sometimes start to decline early next year. How close are we to seeing fleets of robot trucks uh, replacing the three to five million people who work in the trucking industry? Oh gosh. Um, you know, the, uh, the aspect of self-driving vehicles are already standard equipment on many trucks, uh, including emergency braking and all kinds of other things and keeping the truck, uh, between, uh, in line, in, the, in its lane. Yeah. Those things are already there. Uh, there have been experiments with convoys, you know, where you have, uh, a bunch of trucks, uh, following one lead truck and the lead truck may have a driver and the rest of the trucks may not. Um, you know, I mean, this is experimental and, uh, in terms of having no driver in the truck, uh, a truck is a very dangerous thing. You know, when it goes down the highway at 65 miles per hour and, uh, you need, uh, a, uh, you know, a relatively fail safe, uh, entity, whether that's a human being or computer to drive this thing, you know, and, and as long as we have, uh, um, 
you know, algorithms that don't know exactly what they're doing and we have sensors that don't, you know, exactly see what's there, uh, you know, there, uh, there's going to be problems. The thing is, human drivers are not perfect. In the United States, about 36,000 people get killed every year by human drivers. Uh, so, you know, the, uh, as soon as we can replace human drivers with better uh, machines, you know, we'll, we'll all be better off. But uh, that point is just not quite happening yet. And uh, I, I think, um, you know, I, I'm... From the data that I see, uh, I, I think it's a it's a very tough challenge, but I think it will it will arrive, and it will arrive in small steps. And it already has arrived. The first small steps have arrived. You know, with uh, with the driving aids that are now standard equipment on trucks and on cars too. You know, how I many have cars can parallel park on their own and do those kinds of things? You know, and uh, uh, <clears throat> these uh, these small steps will continue to to move forward and. Vehicles will become gradually uh, more and more self-driving with the human driver still there. And then the final transition will be when the human driver doesn't have to be there anymore. Uh, and that point, uh, I don't know how far that is away, but it, it, it's not going to happen next year, that's for sure. I mean, this is still a few years out. And, uh, uh, but the industry is working very hard on this. And, you know, that when... And it won't replace all vehicles and all drivers at the same time. You know, you'll, you'll have, once, once it's established that these vehicles are actually safe and that they don't cause, uh, any more accidents than humans and hopefully cause a lot less accidents than humans, uh, when that is established, uh, you will see very gradually the fleet, uh, switching over to those vehicles. So there will be human drivers behind the wheel on almost all trucks for a long time after uh, the first self-driving trucks hit the road, you know, first commercial self-driving trucks hit, hit the road. And uh, this, so this will be a very gradual process. A, a truck has a fairly long lifetime. You know, not going to throw out a, a truck you bought last year just because today you could replace it with a self-driving unit. Yeah. So uh, uh, maybe you'll sell it as a used truck, but then some other t- trucking company will drive that as a, as a as a truck, so it yeah the the, the phase out of drivers, if it happens and when it happens, will happen very gradually, and uh, at the same time it will be yeah it will be a very traumatic uh, and a catastrophic experience uh, for uh, uh, the the people that uh, that make a living that way, and uh, it's not just truck drivers you know in that case it will be uh, taxi drivers and Uber drivers and and uh, delivery drivers and there's you know many there's you know, many millions of people that make the living that way and uh, so if self driving technology uh, gets to the level where it can actually safely replace a human driver uh, yeah this will be a very significant and very traumatic uh, change in uh, in the economy and and in uh, in the labor market you know and it will be just one more industry that essentially eliminates its workers. And that we've gone through that in manufacturing, you know, the automation and, and all that took, took, took many, many decades and it's very gradual, you know, but it's really what happened. And, uh, so this will be just one more step in that. And, and I think the society needs to prepare for it in some way. We can't completely ignore it and wait till it's already happening. Sure, and I could see a debate. Do you tip the car that delivered your pizza? <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly wouldn't unless the car pulls out a gun and makes me. Yeah. So, uh... <laughs> we'll have more with Wolf Richter when This Week in Money returns. Welcome back. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Magnum Gold Corp, MGI and the TSX Venture Exchange. A 2015 drill program on the LH property intersected several high-grade gold intersections, including 11 meters of 20.66 grams per ton gold. Additional drill targets on the LH property have been identified by a 2018 drone airborne magnetic survey to further evaluate a pyrotite enriched gold bearing system. Please visit our website at magnumgoldcorp.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, 
radio and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Wolf Richter. Wolf, after tax cuts and spending increases, the U.S. government debt is surging. Who exactly is buying all those Treasury securities? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question that we always ask and always worry about. You know, the United States government now owes almost $22 trillion to uh, various investors. And uh, over the last 12 months, its debt increased. And these are treasury securities, so it's debt increased by $1.3 trillion in, in just 12 months. And so there had to be buyers out there for the $1.3 trillion. And, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Fed comes out every year with, uh, its data, I mean, every month with its data on who holds these treasury securities. And it's very interesting to see that change. Uh, the two biggest creditors have always been, or in the last two decades, you know, have been China and Japan. And, uh, at first Japan and then China grew to be number one. And, uh, and for a long time, I mean, by very, very big margin, and for a long time, uh, we thought that, you know, the United States would be financially dependent on these two countries to buy our debt. But, uh, these two countries have now been, uh, shedding the Treasury security uh, for a while. In, in Japan, it started back in 2014 from its peak, and uh, it had dropped now close to 20% uh, in, the, in the latest data in, in October. Japan held barely over $1 trillion in Treasury security. Uh, and uh, in, in China, you know, that's been dropping too. So the Chinese held uh, $1.1 trillion of U.S. Treasury securities. Now, in October, for the first time in, in a couple of decades, uh, those two countries combined held less than 10% of the U.S. Treasury debt. Uh, they were so important that before, you know, they were holding over 15% and, and more. Now, as our debt has increased, and as their holdings, Japan's and China's holdings have decreased, their, their, their importance uh, as creditors to the United States has decreased. And so now they're down to 9.9%. And a similar thing repeats in among other foreign holders. Now, there's no other foreign holder anywhere near as big as China and Japan. The next uh, uh, country in line is Brazil with uh, $300 billion in treasury holdings. So that's about a third of, uh, of what Japan is. And then there's some tax havens that are tiny outfits uh, like Cayman Islands and Luxembourg and Ireland and Hong Kong, you know, that hold a fairly good size portion of U.S. Treasury simply because of their function as uh, as, as tax haven. And uh, but overall, and, and Russia has completely dumped its, its holdings. I mean, it's down to 14 billion. It's gotten rid of over 90 percent of it over the last couple of years. Uh, so that's no longer a factor either. And uh, in total, all foreign holders have uh, uh, shed $125 billion of the Treasury securities over the past year, and they're now down to $6 trillion, $6.2 trillion. Uh, so we're, the United States is becoming less and less reliant on uh, foreign countries, foreign holders, uh, for its credit need. Uh, the U.S. government entities, such as Social Security and other pension funds, they have increased their holdings by $168 billion. So... Uh, Social Security Trust Fund holds about half of that, and uh, uh, and that's the uh, total is nine, it's about six trillion, and and uh, Social Security is about half of that. Now that amount increased by 168 billion, so more than making up for the decrease of the foreign holdings. The Federal Reserve under QE has bought these securities, but it is now unwinding its QE. So during the time period of those 12 months, it shed $190 billion of Treasury. So it, too, is a net seller. And uh, so that leaves about $1.4 trillion in Treasuries with just about everybody else getting shedding them. Now, who's buying? And uh, the entities that are buying are American entities, American banks, uh, American 
mutual funds, bond mutual funds, individual investors, uh, pension funds, and combined they have increased their holdings by 1.4 trillion. So this debt is becoming more and more uh, a, uh, a nationalized, if you will, uh, with less impact uh, from from foreign buying. And the reason is is fairly simple. Yeah, you know, the, these treasury securities are becoming very popular because of the their yield, the security. So you know, if you if you bought a one year treasury a year ago, uh, you made a little over two percent. Uh, if you uh, if you're in the stock market uh, for this year, you know you had a lot of volatility, and uh, the, the year isn't up yet. But you're right now you're looking at a decline of around four percent or so. So uh, these have become immensely popular among American uh, investors, institutional and individual investors both, and they have just piled into this with massive numbers. Now you could say, well, why isn't Europe or European investors doing the same thing? You know, they have a uh, a negative interest rate environment over there. They can get absolutely nothing on the European bonds, on the euro bonds. Uh, so they would be very tempted to buy these dollar uh, securities. And, uh, you know, they're engaging in uh, currency risk when they do that. So in order to gain, you know, 2 or 3%, they have to take a very large currency risk. And uh, so for most investors, that's not worth it. You could hedge against it, but hedging against this currency risk now is so expensive that uh, it, it's, it's not worth it at these kinds of yields. So the, you know, the European investors that don't want to engage in currency risk, and the same with Japanese investors, if they don't want to engage in currency risk, uh, you know, they're going to avoid treasuries. And that leaves, uh, you know, the very enthusiastic American buyers. I mean, they're just great. Right now, treasuries are just great investments. And uh, the credit risk is almost zero, uh, you know, especially on the short end of the uh, uh, of the curve. You know, you get one or two-year treasury uh, securities with with a very nice yield, even six-month treasury securities. Uh, yeah, this is – and you can roll them over. It, it's low cost. Uh, you can invest in uh, – uh, and treasury security mutual funds, uh, you know, they have similar yields. So, and these are very, very popular right now, and, and you can tell how popular they are because, you know, American individual and institutions, uh, added 1.4 trillion of, of these treasury securities to their holdings over the past 12 months, which is huge. I mean, that is a historically large amount. And, uh, and it keeps the yields down in the United States, you know, because there's so much demand locally. Uh, for this paper, and uh, it keeps the 10-year yield down. I mean, the 10-year yield dropped again, you know, and so uh, demand causes these yields to uh, prevent these yields from spiking, uh, even as uh, the Fed is raising rates. So, you know, that's where it's going. Do you think the U.S. government will be able to actually erase its deficit, let alone pay back its debt? <laughs> I, uh, you know, the, the, I, I, I don't think it will ever be able or be willing to erase its debt. Uh, but, you know, it could be at some point in the future that some kind of American government uh, might be able, meaning some kind of Congress of a composition that we can't imagine today, uh, might be able uh, to agree on, on, uh, on a budget that would actually balance uh, in good times. And, uh, but we're a million miles away from it. I mean, it used to be that the Republicans were the fiscal hawks. Uh, now the Republicans are in total control. They're, you know, they're running the Senate. They're running, uh, the House of Representatives. They're running the White House. And they have turned out to be, uh, the biggest hogs out there. You know, they have increased spending. Uh, they have cut taxes and, and now the deficit is just blowing out. These are the good times now. The economy is strong. The economy this year will grow at a rate close to three percent, which we haven't seen in a while. You know, this is the good growth rate. The you know the 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 deficit should disappear essentially when the economy grows like this. But instead, you know, it's just blowing out. And you know, eventually, the economy is going to slow. You know, eventually, we're going to get our recession. That may not be happening in 2019, but if not 2019, maybe in 2020. And when it happens, you know, revenues are dropping and expenditures are rising simply because that's how an, how our, uh, an economy works. Suddenly, unemployment expenses go up, and all kinds of things go up, and people are out of 
the job, so they're not paying any taxes. The revenues go down, and that's when uh, traditionally in a recession, that's when deficits really balloon. Now we already have a ballooning deficit in good times, and uh, so when we get to our next recession, this is going to be uh, one heck of a party. I mean, we could easily hit uh, two trillion dollars in additional debt per year, or maybe even more during during a mild recession. And if we have another financial crisis, God knows what will happen. You know. So we're completely, the government is completely unprepared in terms of its budget uh, for for the next recession. I mean, it's, it's, it's just ridiculous what they're doing right now. Wolf, do you have any suggestions for them, or is the problem so big one human can't solve it? Well, it's a democracy, so one human can solve it, sure, by definition. You know, but there there is no will at this point you know, to do anything. Uh, corporate America didn't need that tax cut. And the yeah, Iowa Corporation, so I, I, I'll benefit from it and fine, you know, but I really didn't need that. And uh, corporate America already pays very few taxes, even though our marginal tax rate is one of the highest in the world, but companies don't pay that. You know, there's so many ways you get around everything. So many companies don't pay any taxes at all. And, uh, uh, and you yeah, know, the tax code is unfair. It needs to be thrown out and we need to start over again. Uh, I mean, that's a separate question, but but corporate America is not overpaying in taxes, and now they've got this huge tax cut. Um, So that's a problem. Uh, And and then tax for being unfair, you know, some companies pay a fairly large percentage of their income in taxes, and others pay zero. And depending on how big your lobbyists are, you know, how powerful, you know, uh, you get your special uh, loopholes into the tax code. And so that's just the unfairness of it. So this, this really, the, the, the corporate tax code needs to be thrown out and we need to start over again. Um, in terms of uh, uh, the military, industrial, and intelligence complex in the United States, you know, it is massive and huge and growing rapidly. And, you know, it's not just in the, the, the budget of the Defense Department. It's the, the nuclear arms portion of the Defense Department or in the Energy Department, you know, in the budget. Uh, the as part of the intelligence expenditures are in the Department of Homeland Security. You have the Veterans Administration, the separate department. So it's really spread out. When you add it all up, it's, it's one gigantic amount that we spent on this. And then we have all the foreign wars that we're fighting, you know, and and and, uh, and it's a huge lobby for these kinds of activities. And it's very, very difficult to contain this. Now, when Republicans took total control of Congress and the White House, yeah, uh, these expenditures surged, and uh, and it's it's uh, you know it's inexplicable uh, why this is happening, and uh, yeah, I mean it it uh, it makes some companies very very rich, and a lot of defense contractors and others, uh, but it's it's unnecessary, and and much of it is a complete waste, and this really should be addressed, but. I don't think there's anybody strong enough right now to to oppose the lobby of this, this huge industry that makes up the you know the military, industrial, and intelligence complex. And uh, uh, I mean, this is in, in, in California. You know, is one of the hotbeds for this. And uh, uh, so you know, you put a bunch of Californian Democrats into Congress, and they're all voting for this stuff. You know, so it. <laughs> I need to bring home the bacon. And, you know, it, it's just very tough. And all these big military projects are spread out over every state so that every lawmaker has has a stake in it. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it it makes it very difficult to do anything about this. But this really, that this will be the number one uh, project to look at uh, for for a budget reduction. I mean, there's taxes we can raise on, on companies, and we need to throw out that tax code, so that's on the revenue side. But on the, and to make it fairer, too, you know, and, and on the expenditure side, I mean, that thing is just one gigantic blob uh, that that's completely out of control. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know that uh, we ever get the lawmakers that, and, and it's really in Congress where this is happening, and I don't know that we'll ever get the lawmakers that have the guts uh, to stand up to it. We need to, you know, it needs to be not just one lawmaker, but it needs to be a majority. And uh, uh, there's there's not many lawmakers out there that have any kind of guts to do this right now. 
Wolf, can you tell us a little bit about Wolf Street and how people can get more information about it? WolfStreet.com, we're strictly focused on economics, finance, and business. Uh, we don't engage in partisan politics. Uh, everything is free, and uh, we have a very vibrant common section, polite, civil, and vibrant, uh, with a lot of insiders uh, posting comments. Uh, so um, come join us. Wolf, thank you so much for being on This Week in Money, and Happy New Year. Thank you, Jim. Happy New Year, too. My guest has been Wolf Richter, publisher of WolfStreet.com. He was speaking to us from San Francisco. And that wraps up our show for this week. We'd like to thank our guests, Ross Clark, Dan Harris, Wolf Richter, and thank you for listening. If you have any questions for our guests or for the show, you can send them to info at HowStreet.com. Now stand by for a company showcase update from Larry Ray, the CEO and President of American Manganese. I'm Jim Goddard. We'll be back next week with more This Week in Money. Comments made on This Week in Money are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated. Executive producer is Tom Allen. Welcome to Company Showcase, an advertising feature on HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. I'm speaking with Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Jim. It's always good to talk to you. Larry, what does the new year promise for American Manganese? Well, let me just briefly you know, describe what has happened in the last, uh, well, probably the last month. Uh, we've met a lot of our goalposts. Uh, you know, we've got the patent proven now, which is just, uh, you know, a heartbeat away from uh, getting the, uh, the patent number. We have entered into an MOU with the group out of the Netherlands, Battery Safety Solutions. And, uh, which puts us in a whole different category. You know, we've got the, the major end, which is getting the, uh, product out, the, uh, the battery materials, uh, metals, I should say, uh, and the cathode, and that being, uh, cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. So, uh, we've made some major hurdles, we got over some major hurdles last year. And now we're looking forward to starting up the plant early in the year. The, uh, the, uh, that will, uh, occur at the Kometco yard, you know, the pilot plant. So, uh, that's going to be newsworthy. And, uh, certainly, uh, right after that, we'll start working on a, uh, a plan to, uh, get a commercial plant going. We're talking three tons a month. But there's nothing to say, depending on uh, when we get some numbers back, uh, we might not increase that up to as high as 10 tons a month. So that's uh, that's looking good. In the meantime, there's lots of controversy out there. There's pros and cons for the, res- for the uh, electric vehicle battery industry. And uh, I've been following that quite co- closely. The... Uh, you know, basically they're saying that, uh, that electric cars are more polluting than, uh, than, uh, gas driven vehicles. So, uh, and, you know, if you add everything in that they add in, they throw in the kitchen sink and everything else, uh, perhaps that's true. But they're also saying there's no solution for the, uh, recycling of batteries. Well, we're here to tell them there is a solution. And after our MOU with the uh, the people out of the Netherlands, this uh, looks like we could uh, have a total carbon-free solution for the for the recycling of the battery, because now uh, we'll be able to, and the Europeans are doing this when they're dismantling and uh, preparing the cathode material to go into uh, the circuit. They're uh, draining off the uh, power from the uh, that's left in the batteries, storing it, and using that to uh, run the plant. So 
So that would uh, make the, you know, the solution that we have combined with that a total carbon free solution. And, uh, it doesn't seem like people are you know, getting that message in some places, but, uh, that's what we can promise the world. Now, what am I looking at out there? I'm looking at the fact that, uh, that uh, we have a solution that uh, will gel with uh, some of these battery manufacturers. Let's face it, you know, if you're if you're looking at uh, resistance because of pollution, one of those things can be cut out, and that's in the uh, in the uh, battery itself. And it'll also affect the mining, and uh, certainly affect the power sources. All these things that uh, that they're facing. So I expect that sometime in this coming year that we will probably start getting a lot of calls from people that are serious about making batteries and recycling them. And uh, this is nothing but good news for the uh, shareholders of this company. And, uh, you know, we've worked hard to get to this point, and uh, we've been supported by the shareholders, and I say 100% by the shareholders. And... Uh, you know, and now it's time this coming year to start looking at getting some rewards. And I see that coming. The market itself, well, that's been playing out in a pretty ugly way. Um, even today, the uh, market was, uh, last I looked, was up slightly. New York, I'm talking about New York, because when uh, the New York market gets a cold, gets a, a cold, we get pneumonia, and you, everybody knows that. So uh, I would say that this market will settle out and we'll see within the first two to three weeks of, uh, of uh, January in what direction the market's going to go in. And uh, I'd like to say that uh, I believe that it will go positive. But, you know, that will the market will tell the tale. <clears throat> now... What can we expect? Well, we can expect that uh, we will uh, have good news coming all year round. We've uh, always, I've always figured we have. I've worked with Cometco quite closely, and uh, the uh, when they tell me that they can do something, they usually do. Uh, always have, I should say, and I think that's nothing but positive. So I'm looking forward to a great new year, uh, Jim. And I think our shareholders can expect to have a good year, too. I mean, it's only a matter of time till uh, people start saying, hey, what about this little company up there in uh, B.C.? They seem to have a solution. Let's check it out. And uh, we're happy to have them come and check us out. We've been checked out by uh, certainly a lot of offshore countries. And, uh, you know, now maybe it's time the domestic guys start looking at us. Larry, for people who are new to American Manganese, what's the company all about? The company is a a critical metals company. We have uh, mining properties in the U.S. and in uh, Canada. We'll be working on some of the Canadian ones this year. And we have uh, a patented process for for manganese where we can uh, recover the, uh, from very low grade sources, by the way, two to three percent, we can recover about uh, ninety to ninety five percent of the uh, of the uh, manganese and turn it into electrolytic manganese metal or electrolytic manganese or manganese sulfide, and you know, we can make batteries or we can make steel. Now, we took that process, which is patented in four countries, and uh, we adapted it to uh, recycling lithium-ion batteries. We've been very successful at that. Uh, we've, uh, on a bench scale, we've gotten 100% of all the metals, and uh, we've applied for the patent last November. We got it patent proven here a couple of few weeks ago. And uh, so the uh, company is going to move ahead uh as an urban miner and mine batteries. Now, we are listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange Venture, 
under amy.b. We're listed in the U.S. under amyzf. And we're listed in uh, Frankfurt under 2AM. Our website is AmericanManganeseInc.com. Our phone number is 778-574-4444. My personal email is lray, L-R-E-A-U-G-H, at amymn.com. And uh, you can uh, email me there. Larry, best of the new year. Best of the new year, Jim, and I'm sure thinking this is going to be a great year coming up. I'm Jim Goddard. I've been speaking with Larry Ray, CEO and President of American Manganese. Our conversation took place on December 28th. Comments made on Company Showcase are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at HowStreet.com. Company Showcase is a production of How Street Media Incorporated.